We're in the 15th month of the unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. Let that sink in for a second. A full-scale war with hundreds of thousands of people fighting for the 15th month in a row in Europe. As crazy as it may sound, it is happening right now. In the second half of April, we observed Russia losing its offensive momentum everywhere but Bakhmut. Another fortnight has passed, and we're yet to see the Ukrainian counter-offensive, probably due to rainy weather. Welcome to another Kings and Generals update on the war. We have lighter news also. Father's Day is coming up and we're going to help you get an ideal gift. That's because we're sponsored today by Ridge, whose modernized everyday accessories will be available at up to 40% off through June 15th in their Father's Day sale. Your best bet is the classic Ridge wallet, a sleek and rugged upgrade on the age-old wallet design. It's built with military-grade materials for lifelong durability and designed for great ease of use, a small profile with 12-card capacity, and it also blocks RFID signals to fight digital thieves and comes with a lifetime guarantee. Alternatively, there is the Ridge key case, as your dad likely has a massive bundle of keys that could use an upgrade. The key case is a quiet and easy way to hold up to six keys in your pocket without any hassle and just feels cooler than untangling your key rings as you go about your day. The wallets and key cases come with a 99-day return policy if your recipient doesn't like them, so you can gift them risk-free. And there's a load of other stuff included in the Father's Day sale too, and you're sure to find something ideal if you visit ridge.com slash kingsandgenerals. Save up to 40% through June 15th and see why Ridge has over 50,000 five-star reviews. That's ridge.com slash kingsandgenerals. Russia continued making progress in and around Bakhmut during this period. By April 19th, Wagner advanced closer to the 00506 road in the northwest of the town. As Russian units already control portions of the H32 highway, the 00506 road remains the sole supply line controlled by the Ukrainians. The loss of these territories is even more significant because the terrain between these roads is muddy and difficult for armored vehicles to drive on. The Russians advanced around the H-32 highway two days later and gained ground west of Dubovo Vasilivka. On April 23rd, it was reported that Wagner captured the train station in Bakhmut. By late April, Wagner had most of Bakhmut under control, except for the city's western outskirts. On April 24th, Zelensky reiterated that Ukraine would not leave Bakhmut without a fight, as losing this city would allow the Russians to widen their front and capture more Ukrainian territory, opening a way for the Russian army to Kramatorsk and Slovyansk. At this moment, it looks like Bakhmut is on the brink of falling and the Ukrainian army will have to fall back to the next defensive line. But apparently the situation of Wagner units in the Bakhmut section is problematic too, if we believe another rant by Prigozhin. On April 28th, he claimed that Russia is on the brink of catastrophe Prigozhin indirectly acknowledged the high rate of casualties suffered by Wagner in the Battle of Bakhmut, saying, Wagner, in a short period of time, will cease to exist. We will become history. Nothing to worry about. Things like this happen. Prigozhin also informed about his letter to Shoigu, with a request to immediately issue ammunition. In case of refusal, I consider it necessary to inform the Supreme Commander-in-Chief, Putin, about the existing problem in order to make a decision and about the advisability of further presence of the Wagner PMC in Bakhmut in conditions of ammunition shortage. He added that, if the shortage does not stop, we will be forced to withdraw part of the units from this territory and then everything else will collapse. Prigozhin also warned the Russian public that the Ukrainian counteroffensive would start no later than May 15th. The Wagner chief is basically trying to blackmail the Russian command into giving his team of mercenaries more shells, threatening a withdrawal otherwise. Prigozhin has been less belligerent towards the Russian Ministry of Defense in recent weeks. This interview is a marked return to his highly critical attitude towards the Russian command. In the Avdivka sector, the Russian assault has largely stalled. DPR units achieved some success near Novoselivka and Novokalinova, but by and large, Ukrainian forces have halted the Russian advance. In this period, several notable developments occurred on the Kherson front. For months, this front was stable and expected to remain like this due to the river Dnipro, a significant natural barrier for any offensive operations. 
This front has also been overlooked in terms of a potential axis of the Ukrainian counter-offensive. On April 20th, Russian telegram channels and military bloggers started complaining of increased presence and established positions of Ukrainian forces on the left bank of the Dnipro. The original telegram post, which sparked discussion about the situation along the Dnipro, stated that the Ukrainian forces had created a foothold on the left bank of the Dnipro near the Antonovsky Bridge. The blogger claimed that the Ukrainians have been able to regularly supply their forces on the left bank via military boats. He criticized the Russian command for excessive bureaucracy, which prevented the Russian artillery on the left bank from striking the Ukrainian forces before they changed their position or disappeared. Later, other Russian military bloggers chimed in with claims that Ukraine has taken control over several Dnipro Delta islands. The spokesperson of the Ukrainian army, Natalia Humenyuk, tried to temper the excitement regarding this development, stating that crossing such a wide river like the Dnipro is very difficult. She urged everyone to remain patient and to let the Ukrainian forces do their job in silence. Many military commentators agree that the established Ukrainian presence in the Dechi area, north of Oleshki, is not a precursor of massive events to happen on the left bank of the Dnipro. It is a swampy area, which is not a good starting point for an offensive. The Ukrainians are still unable to bring tanks and armoured vehicles to the left bank. The Dachi area has almost no road network, which is another problem, if Ukraine is indeed planning to use this area as a staging point for an attack. So at this point, Ukraine does not have a usable bridgehead on the left bank of the Dnipro. Still, high activity and presence of Ukrainian special forces in the Dnipro Delta and on the left bank do an essential job of fixing Russian troops along the river. In this period, Russia somewhat increased its intensity of strikes on Ukraine. On April 19th, 21 Shahed drones were launched on Odessa. 10 of them were shot down by the Ukrainian air defenses. On April 21st, for the first time in almost a month, Kyiv was targeted by Iranian drones. Russia launched 23 cruise missiles and two drones on Ukraine, and according to the Ukrainian command, they managed to shoot down 21 cruise missiles and the two drones, which is a good result. The notable nuance of this strike was that according to some reports, Iranian Delevia warheads were used in this attack, the delivery of which to Russia has not been reported yet. The most deadly Russian strike in this period was registered on April 28th, with at least 23 civilians dying in Uman when two cruise missiles hit a residential building. Ukraine retaliated with its own attacks on Crimea. On April 24th and 29th, they attacked the Russian Black Sea fleet base in Sevastopol with naval drones and Mugin-5 UAVs. According to the official information from Russia, in this period, Putin visited the occupied area of Kherson Oblast and Luhansk. Officially, the visit took place on April 17th, but Putin's statements from the trip, which were later deleted from the footage, demonstrate that the visit probably happened earlier. It is Putin's second trip to the occupied lands of Ukraine since the start of the full-scale invasion, which may indicate that he is sensitive to criticism of the Russian public regarding his lack of visible presence as a wartime leader, especially in comparison with Zelensky, who regularly visits the front lines. As usual, Prigozhin and Wagner had Russia's most active media presence in this period. On April 17th, Two former Wagner members talked to the media about atrocities committed by them and other Wagner fighters. One of the interviewed fighters claimed that Prigozhin ordered his unit to kill children during the Battle of Solodar. This interview once again demonstrates that Wagner PMC does not have any regard for the lives of civilians and non-combatants. Wagner and regular Russian army units are likely still conducting war crimes as they did in Bucha, Izium, and other areas of Ukraine which had been under Russian occupation. Along with Prigozhin's interview about the upcoming demise of Wagner and shell hunger, which we talked about earlier, the oligarch once again called the Kremlin to focus on the defensive war. Prigozhin said on April 21st that Russia has to dig in in occupied areas and brace for the Ukrainian counter-offensive. Prigozhin claims that Russia would have to defeat the Ukrainian attack and gain some time to restore its military power to continue fighting.
Prigozhin is by no means a dove in the Russian elite, but the fact that he called on setting more realistic goals at this point in the war, i.e. defending rather than attacking, for the second time in April, may indicate the current state of the Russian army. Another incident which has soured the Russian mood is the accidental release of a bomb by an Su-34 flying over Belgorod. The cause of this incident, which has left a 20-meter deep crater in the center of Belgorod, is unclear, but some have speculated on social media that this Su-34 was en route to launching an airstrike on Ukraine. Russia is also taking further steps to solidify its control over the occupied Ukrainian territories. According to Putin's April 27th decree, Ukrainians who refuse to accept Russian citizenship in the occupied territories will now be considered foreigners. Foreigners who support, to quote, extremism and terrorism will be subject to deportation. The most notable diplomatic development from the Russian perspective in this period was the meeting of the Chinese defense minister Li Shangfu with Putin on April 16th. Again, the parties exchanged niceties and praised the military partnership between them. But China did not indicate in any way that they are any closer to supplying weapons to Russia. But China probably made Russia somewhat happy in this period when the Chinese ambassador to France questioned the sovereignty of all former USSR republics. He claimed that since the status of former Soviet republics has not been confirmed by any international agreement, they don't have an effective status in international law. This claim is simply factually wrong. The ambassador also questioned Ukraine's sovereignty over Crimea, as Crimea belonged to Russia from the beginning. It was Khrushchev who gifted Crimea to Ukraine in Soviet times. Apparently, this Chinese ambassador thinks that the beginning of history is the year 1783. These statements were angrily rebutted by officials of Ukraine and Baltic states, prompting the Chinese foreign ministry to assure everyone that China's position regarding Crimea has not changed, while it also reiterated its respect to the sovereignty of all states. China continued its more active involvement in the settlement of the war in Ukraine. On April 26th, Xi Jinping held a phone call with Zelensky. There is not much information about this call, but the Chinese side provided general information about Beijing's intention to deepen discussions with all parties to reach a political settlement of the war. Iran remains the chief military supporter of Russia in this war. On April 24th, the Wall Street Journal reported, based on the accounts of an unnamed Middle Eastern official, that Iran has transferred over 300,000 artillery shells and more than 1 million rounds of ammunition over the Caspian Sea throughout the last six months. In this interview, Ukrainian Minister of Defense Reznikov confirmed that Russia is seeking shells. We have information that they run around the market and ask for shells. Reznikov also added that both Iran and North Korea are supporting Russia militarily. In this period, one of the Pentagon leaks informed about Russia's experimentation with the Tobol electronic warfare system to fight Starlink systems heavily used by the Ukrainians. This is an important aspect of warfare which often goes unseen. But another Pentagon leak, talking about the limited success of Ukrainian JDAMs due to Russian electronic warfare systems, indicates an impact they may have on the battlefield. To conclude the topic of internal developments in Russia with an impact on the war in Ukraine, we should inform you about the decision of the Russian government to stop publishing data on gas output. This is probably linked to the dropping energy revenues of Russia. The Kremlin likely wants to avoid this being discussed by the Russian public. While Russia is wrapping up its offensive operations and is trying to complete the capture of Bakhmut, the Ukrainian army is getting ready for its counter-offensive. We have recently released another video about the highly anticipated Ukrainian counter-offensive, the link is in the description, so we're not going to dive deep into this topic here. But let's highlight the most notable statements of Ukrainian officials on this matter. On April 17th, the Secretary of the Ukrainian Security Council, Danilov, assured that Ukraine is not going to launch its assault without being thoroughly prepared. He probably implies that Ukraine has been delaying the operation due to holdups in delivery of Western supplies, while also voiced his dissatisfaction with the situation, saying that officials of allied countries sometimes say one thing and do completely the opposite. The spokesperson of the Ukrainian army, Hanna Malia, stated on April 19th 
that the Ukrainians are already conducting counter-offensive actions. This is probably a rhetorical statement, which nevertheless may inform about preparatory actions carried out by the Ukrainian forces to improve their launching positions or to collect information about defensive positions of the Russian army. Some Ukrainian officials are generally hyping up the counter-offensive, while others call to temper expectations. The chief of Ukrainian military intelligence, Kirillo Budinov, stated they are approaching an important battle in the modern history of Ukraine. Being his usual optimistic self, Budinov claimed that reaching the border of the country in 2023 is a realistic goal. Zelensky also conveyed an optimistic message regarding the counter-offensive, stating that he believes in the future of the counter-offensive and in the liberation of Crimea. On the contrary, Reznikov and Kaleba have been cautious in their statements. Reznikov agreed that expectations from the counter-offensive are overheated, while Kaleba reiterated his earlier statement, advising against calling the upcoming Ukrainian operation the decisive battle. Ukraine's allies continued making pledges and delivering on their promises of military assistance in this period. On April 16th, the Italian media reported that Italy donated up to 60 M109L self-propelled howitzers. On April 17th, the Slovenian defense ministers announced that Slovakia has transferred all promised 13 MiG-29 jets to Ukraine. While the delivery of Soviet-made jets is good news for Ukraine, they are still fighting for the delivery of much more advanced Western jets, like the F-16. On April 17th, the US Deputy Secretary of Defense, Colin Carl, commented discouragingly on this topic, saying, In the case of a positive decision, it will take 1.5 years for the delivery of F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine. 1.5 years is not the time that Ukraine has at this point, and they will likely have to be content with Soviet-made fighter jets. On April 18th, it was revealed that Patriot Air Defense Systems and the second Iris T system promised by Germany have been delivered to Ukraine. The main topic of the Ramstein meeting on April 21st was air defense too. It looks like the West is prioritizing supply of air defense systems as a sensible substitute for the supply of Western-made jets. While Western-made fighter jets would go a long way to ensure Ukraine's increased air presence, for now, the West is focusing on helping Ukraine to deal with the Russian missile and drone attacks, which is important particularly against the background of the Pentagon leak, claiming that Ukraine is running out of air defense missiles, along with preventing the Russian Air Force from having air superiority. The main outcomes of this Rammstein meeting were the pledge of Germany and the Netherlands to supply minesweepers and transportation vehicles, the conduct of training of Ukrainian servicemen for Abrams tanks and Western air defense systems, the creation of a maintenance center for Leopard 2s in Poland, and promises by allies to support Ukraine for as long as necessary. In Rammstein, the NATO chief Jens Stoltenberg also made an encouraging statement for Ukraine, saying that all NATO allies agree that Ukraine has to become a member of the alliance. Along with that, during the meeting, it was reported that Western allies have already delivered more than 230 tanks and 1,500 other armored vehicles for nine Ukrainian brigades, which will presumably fight in the counter-offensive. On this day, Latvia also pledged to deliver all of its remaining man-portable air defense systems to Ukraine, while Canada promised to purchase $26 million worth of fuel to deliver to Ukraine. On April 19th, Ukraine received two pieces of good news. First, the United States promised another military aid package worth $325 million, including HIMARS munitions and artillery shells. Along with that, South Korean President Yoon Suk-yeol declared that if Russia continues to conduct large-scale attacks on Ukrainian civilians, Korea would revise its long-term policy of not selling weapons to countries at war and send military aid to Ukraine. This was followed by yet another threatening message by former Russian President Medvedev. On April 20th, Denmark and the Netherlands made a joint announcement on the delivery of 14 Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine. On April 26th, it was reported that Slovenia has unofficially given 20 Veluk armored vehicles. On the same day, the commander of the United States European Command, Christopher Cavalli, stated that Ukraine had already received 98% of promised vehicles. We're covering the Pentagon leaks in another video, 
But let's wrap up the section about military support to Ukraine by developing the earlier report about Egypt's intention to sell weapons to Russia. A leaked document claims that following talks with US officials, Egypt agreed to produce artillery shells for Ukraine instead of helping Russia. Ukraine suffered a painful diplomatic setback with its European allies in this period. On April 16th, Poland and Hungary banned grain imports from Ukraine, hurting local producers. Later, Romania, Slovakia and Bulgaria also joined this ban, which the EU strongly condemned. But it looks like the sides have reached a compromise. It has been reported that the EU has offered these countries to maintain the ban of only four types of grain from Ukraine, while lifting all other measures and offering aid to affected farmers. The optics of this situation are not good at all, neither for Ukraine nor its European allies. They have to find a way to avoid such conflicts and reach agreements before issues get blown out of proportion if they intend to continue demonstrating a united front against Russia. We have reached another stalemate point in this war. Russia has attacked and attacked since December 2022, but it looks like they don't have any more offensive resources to make gains anywhere but Bakhmut in the foreseeable future. Very soon, the Russian army will have to enter a stage of operational pause, at a time when Ukraine is going to strike. For now, what is left for us is to count losses suffered by Russia and Ukraine. There have been no credible reports of manpower losses in this period. According to the Oryx blog, the visually confirmed losses of Russia as of May 1st are 1,925 tanks, 3,989 vehicles, 239 command posts and communication stations, 686 artillery systems and vehicles, 194 multiple rocket launches, 80 aircraft, 84 helicopters, and 219 drones. For Ukraine, these are 493 tanks, 1,431 vehicles, 12 command posts and communication stations, 285 artillery systems and vehicles, 45 multiple rocket launches, 66 aircraft, 29 helicopters, and 105 drones. We're working on more videos on the war in Ukraine, so make sure to subscribe and press the bell button. Please consider liking, subscribing, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Recently, we have started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.